Beautiful. So we've got our lovely 10 top tips for a strong immune system. Uh, if we're starting with that idea, I actually may turn the video off so you can concentrate and I'm not worried about whether my hair is in the right place and all that fun stuff. And we'll concentrate on the slides as we're going through. Da, da, da. Can I do that from here? That's better. So I introduced myself a little bit. Many of you are aware that I also practice iris analysis uh, and use the Biomeridian MSA and SRT to evaluate food sensitivities, nutrient imbalances, gut dysbiosis, uh, looking at organs and organ systems and how energy is flowing through there. I recently partnered with Living Matrix Functional Nutrition and Functional Health Assessments. So that one is really nice, gives a nice timeline and areas to focus on if people aren't so uh, familiar with the Biomeridian. Uh, food sensitivity, autoimmune dysfunction, dysbiosis, chronic conditions are the things that I tend to focus on in my practice. But holistic nutrition really does go beyond the food that you eat. It does include lifestyle and how you manage stress, your quality of sleep, the strength of your relationships, your connection to your community. Uh, so today we'll cover a lot of that. Uh, covering immune system basics. So what is going on with the immune system? What do all the parts mean? So that you have a good understanding of some of that when we come back to it and talk about it as we're going through the seminar. Kind of where they all fit in the bigger picture. Uh, we'll go through theories of disease, the role that nutrient deficiency plays in sickness or in illness or in dis-ease, and then look at what lowers your immune response and what can strengthen your immune response. So places to consider where you might want to make some adjustments to the things that you find you're still doing that you discover could lower your immune response. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about things that can strengthen that. And it's important to look at both ends of the spectrum. I uh, talk about dealing with only supplemental things or trying to boost things while you're not dealing with the other end is a bit like mopping the floor when the toilet's overflowing. You can't really make a lot of headway. We need to stop doing some of the things that are interfering so the other things will work better. And it's not always about wholesale change for everyone. Uh, if you can make one or two small changes that will stop lowering that immune function while adding a couple of things that will strengthen the immune system, big changes can occur overall. So the immune system basics. We have the immune system itself is one of the most diverse systems in the body. There are a lot of parts, your tonsils and your adenoids, most people are aware of where those are located. Your thymus, which is a little lower, your spleen, uh, lymph nodes, appendix, bone marrow, payers patches in the intestines. All of these are components in a very intricate dance in the way that they interact. The main function of your immune system is protection. So protection from foreign invaders, from bacteria and viruses and molds and fungi and parasites, carcinogens, pollution, smoke, toxins, uh, both from inside and outside the body there are toxins. And that main task of your immune system is to fight disease causing germs and microbes and remove them from the body. Secondarily, identifying and neutralizing those harmful substances from your bodily environment. And three, fighting disease causing change in the body. Things like cancer cells. There are two types of immunity, we'll touch on those both innate and adaptive immunity, and they work closely together to remove substances that can cause an immune triggering response. Innate immunity provides defense using immune cells like natural killer cells 
and phagocytes. Adaptive immunity uh, makes use, makes and uses antibodies so that your body can respond quickly to things that you've already seen or been exposed to. You also have barriers. So your skin is the ultimate barrier. It is the largest organ that you have covering your whole surface. And it is physically there to keep things out. So it, it's blocking them from getting in, but it also has billions of microbes on the surface that are also protective. It's quite a symbiotic relationship. And the same is true in the gut. We have the lovely mucous membranes that start at the mouth and end at the anus. And we don't always consider that the digestive tract is actually outside the body. So until things pass through that gut barrier, they haven't entered your body. They're still, you're like a giant human donut. Just things are passing on through until they make it through that membrane. And there are functions within that mucosa. So you have saliva that is slightly acidic that can help to deal with some pathogens that might enter. Further down the trail, you have your stomach that is even more acidic. It has that acidity for a reason. It is there not only to digest your food, but also to help you in dealing with pathogens that will enter bacteria that enter with your food, things like salmonella and E. coli with good stomach acid some of the time you can eliminate those right there. So kill those hardier microbes. So remembering that your digestive tract is still outside your body and that's how it's meant to be because we will talk a little bit about that microbiome as we are moving along. The other piece of that is germ theory versus terrain theory. And germ theory really is the thought that germs equal disease. If you are exposed to something, that's why you get it. Terrain theory deals with the fact that your body is meant to fight these things off. So much like a flower, if you put it in your garden and it's not growing well, you don't blame the flower. You give it a little more nutrients or you give it some water or you move the position further into the sun or away from the sun and it can flourish. And our bodies are a lot the same. We're complicated plants a lot of the time. Beauchamp and his various discoveries really led him to believe in terrain theory. So whether it was poor nutrition or toxicity or other factors that would weaken that system, it was that weak system that allowed any microbes that were present in the body to then produce symptoms of disease. There are signs that your terrain might need some help, might need some tidying up, whether it's overactive or underactive. Uh, some of that would be frequent or lengthy colds and flus. So if you finish one cold and then you've got another one, that's a sign that maybe there's something bigger going on in your terrain. Food allergies or sensitivities, things like asthma or eczema, are signs, autoimmune disease, and there are over a hundred of those. So if your immune system is overactive, there might be things that you wanna do to calm that down. So it's not off there busy fighting its own tissues and not dealing with those invaders. And inflammation is a big one. Um, we talk about all disease comes down to inflammation and all disease often begins in the gut. So it's a big spectrum. Uh, weakening the immune system is one of the big things with inflammation. So what you eat, how you live can impact that inflammation. I posted a blog last week about the inflammatory pathway that happens with food sensitivities and other interferences with that system and how it can cause inflammation at the end of the road. Uh, Dr. Bernard Jensen and his theory that we do not catch diseases, we create them by breaking down natural defenses according to the way we eat, drink, think, and live. Because it is big, it's a bigger picture than just the food we eat. It's lifestyle, it's the negative thoughts that we have in our head or the negative images that we're watching on television. And a little bit of the deficiency piece. So. 
where those deficiencies that are most common with different diseases. Certainly, the terrain needs to be out of balance, and that is one key component, that nutrition, that we do have a lot of control over. We talk about what is going on with the immune system. It was a headline that I pulled from PubMed looking at um, an episode of Vaccine Magazine or Journal, and they were AIDS, avian flu, SARS, MERS, Ebola, Zika, what's next? Well, now we know what's next. And I guess that's really the bigger point of this entire webinar is that it doesn't matter what the microbe is that you're exposed to. Our job is to do our best to support our body so that when those invaders do come in, the body can have an appropriate and timely response. So what lowers immune response? This is where people start groaning and making frowny faces. So nutrient deficiency. We will talk about nutrition a lot. I'm sure you're not surprised by that when we're going through how to boost it, but being aware that nutrients are really important. Dehydration, so making sure you're drinking enough and we'll talk about that. A poor digestive system and poor digestive health. So over 70% of your immune system resides in the gut. And in this office, we spend a lot of time talking about good gut health. The gut mucosa is there to keep the bad stuff out and the good stuff in when it's working well. It's a very complex dance that it's doing to know what to let in and what to let out. There are tests that we can do to have a look at how permeable the gut is. People talk about leaky gut. That's a part of it. If it's letting through proteins or pathogens very easily that it ought not. We can measure a level of zonulin is the test that we would look at. And it's important to keep that microbiome, the good bacteria in that system working well too, because they really are a big part of that immune response. Uh, stress and fear. So we touched on that a little bit already. Just that negative imaging all the time does suppress the immune system. So we want to be able to take a break. And that's a whole nother webinar in and of itself on how to recognize and deal with stress in life. Uh, poor sleep, we'll talk a lot about um, lack of exercise. Uh, smoking, I think, goes without saying that inhaling hundreds of toxins with every puff of a cigarette won't do an immune system any favors. Alcohol, I know, grown. Um, it's sugar. It inhibits the immune system. It is a toxin. It behaves like a toxin in the body. So it has to be dealt with, which can suck up nutrients that could be better off dealing with other things that are actually out of your control and perhaps more harmful. Alcohol also inhibits immune function directly. It inhibits macrophage activity. Macrophages are cells that will engulf and destroy the bad guys that are in there, uh, as well as downregulating the T cells. And T cells are the ones that identify and are involved in antibody production. We want to consider moderation if elimination is completely off the table. Um, one serving of alcohol several times a week isn't necessarily harmful according to the studies. It's the two and three drinks every night that really causes that long-term issue. And part of that is the stress that it causes on the body. And it is a form of long-term stress. Short-term stress, we are designed to deal with, whether it's you know running to catch a bus when you're in grade school or running around searching for your cell phone before you leave the house, that short-term stress is normal and natural and our bodies are designed for it. What they're not designed for is chronic high stress of the ever-present deadlines and the horrifying media coverage and not enough sleep and all of those things. They are all forms of stress. The other piece is medication. 
Definitely medications, especially antibiotics, can impact that lovely microbiome. We don't want to kill off those bad guys if we can help it. Kill off the good, kill off the bad guys, but also kill off the good guys. Um, PPIs, so proton pump inhibitors, which lower stomach acid. Uh, we talked about acid being part of our defense mechanism. So if we are lowering that defense mechanism, it can leave chinks in the armor where nasty things can find their way through. Uh, Tylenol is another one that there's a lot of evidence will lower the immune response. It lowers levels of glutathione, and we'll talk about glutathione, but it's really important for the airway response. If you're lowering glutathione, you're lowering your body's airway response. And in times when we're concerned about diseases that might impact our airway, we probably don't want to do that. And then how do we strengthen our immune system? And strengthen is the term that I would use. A lot of people will say boost. There are a significant number of people who ought not be boosting their immune system. And these are people who already have overactive immune systems. They have an autoimmune condition, whether it's an autoimmune thyroid condition, autoimmune skin like eczema, as I said, there are hundreds of autoimmune diseases, but if your body's busily attacking itself through that autoimmune response, we don't want to do things that will upregulate our immune system. It's already doing a lot. We may want to modulate the immune system, so help it to be a little less active in places it shouldn't be overactive. But strengthen versus boost is a clarification that I think is important. Number one, it's an easy one, uh, wash your hands. And we hear it all the time now with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, coughing into your elbow, cover your sneezes, be mindful of close contact with people that are not in your household or in your bubble or however we're describing it. Soap and water is preferred. Sanitizer comes with a whole host of issues. We were really concerned about being overly hygienic really recently and all of a sudden we're not. Our bodies do need something to do. If we are super, super clean, they don't have anything to fight, they can often turn on their own tissues out of kind of a cellular boredom. The other piece that I think fits with this slide that I've talked about with some groups already is one simple change that people can make and it is closing the lid of the toilet before you flush. And it's the age old argument that people have, the man always leaves the toilet seat up and she always leaves the seat down. I'm like, I don't care, both of you close the lid, then it's fair. And the reason for that is a lovely phenomenon known as toilet plume. And this is microscopic particles of whatever was in the toilet since you last cleaned it. Often microscopic fecal matter and studies will show that that matter can spray between three and 15 feet, depending on the shape of the toilet and the strength of the water and all the lovely variables. But if we're picturing things that are, you know, six to eight feet average from the toilet, it's things like hand towels and toothbrushes and the vanity where we set our hairbrush. So closing the lid can do a lot to deal with infectious disease. I see a lot of clients that come in with recurrent issues or issues that have spread through the family. And that is one thing that everybody's like, oh, that's disgusting. And I never would have thought of it. And it's an easy change to make. I had a hotel room once that had the pusher for the toilet flush on the back of the toilet tank, like the face of the toilet tank. So you had to close the lid to flush the toilet. Like that should be necessary, 100% manufacturing. That's what I want to see. Managing blood sugar and blood pressure. And this piece has to do a little bit with the sugar. So. Studies will show one teaspoon of sugar will suppress immune function for up to four hours. 
So if we're looking at, you know, the typical breakfast food for the standard American diet, it's cereal or toast, or if you're really out there, Pop-Tarts and Eggos and that kind of thing. We don't always consider how much actual sugar, and it's not about added sugar, it's the metabolic sugar. So if, even if you're having toast with peanut butter, there's as soon as you chew that wheat bread, it is sugar. It's a complex carb that turns into a simple sugar just by the action of your saliva. Uh, when I was with Healthaholics, we had a real food reset where we would do sugar-free eating for 10 days. And people were always surprised to find which foods contain high amounts of sugar. And of course we think, yeah, fruit has natural sugars carbs, okay, they're going to be sugar when you chew them. But there were other things, things like table salt may contain added sugar. And it was surprising when people would come in and report the places that they would see that kind of thing. Uh, the piece of the immune system that is inhibited most by sugar is the phagocytes. We saw them on the first slide. The phagocytes are the ones that just eat up the bad guys. We want them to do that, things like viruses and bacteria. If they're present, we want phagocyte activity to come in and chew them up and have them gone. Sugar also feeds bad bacteria. It will feed yeast overgrowth in the gut. And overgrowth of these things is another form of stress and it will weaken your immune system. Uh, eating nutrient dense foods. So here's the nutritionist in me coming out. Uh, nutrients will play a role in immune function. There are dozens of pathways that require different nutrients. If you're eating the rainbow, colorful foods. Back when I was in school, the food guide was a rainbow, maybe telling my age there. Um, but that protection of different colors of food have different phytonutrients, and that's what it's all about. If you're only eating green food, you're missing the good stuff that comes from the purple foods and the red foods and the orange foods. So we want to eat that rainbow. Think about adding white foods, things like parsnips and radishes and horseradish. Those add different phytonutrients that we don't always think about. Uh, protein is another one. The antibody cells that our body produces are made of protein. They require protein to be created in the body. If you have a deficit of protein, it's harder and harder to make those immune antibody cells. And it doesn't have to be meat. Some people are not big meat eaters, but vegetarians and vegans need to be much more mindful of including protein with each eating opportunity, as the lovely Veronica would say. So if we are eating, we want to make sure we are including some kind of protein. Meats lovely, but eggs or nuts and seeds or beans can all add protein. Mushrooms are one that aren't pictured, but they are magnificent powerhouses of nutrition. They will enhance that macrophage, that engulf and destroy type of activity of the immune system. And they also help to activate the natural killer cells. Those are the ones that sneak in like a Trojan horse and kill them from the inside. They're also really high in beta-glucans, high in antioxidants. They're anti-inflammatory. But we do want to try and make choices that aren't just the simple white button mushrooms. Something a little more fun, Things like uh, shiitake mushrooms or reishi mushrooms or chaga taste lovely as a tea. We can add those in. Mushrooms are also a good source of selenium and zinc and sometimes even vitamin D. And each of those have roles within specific pathways of the immune system. So the immune cells, all immune cells require zinc at some point in their pathway. Some people will try and do that with zinc supplementation. Definitely chat with a professional before you do that because it can impact the zinc copper balance. I much rather try and boost zinc with food 
Oysters are sometimes a tough sell for people. I like them, but not everyone's going there. Uh, but seeds are often a decent choice. Pumpkin seeds, I think, are the one of the higher ones. Sesame seeds, good source of zinc as well. And optimizing vitamin D. So mushrooms, depending on how they're grown, they do have to be out in the sun with their gills up to get enough vitamin D. Um, but research does show a really strong correlation between low vitamin D and the severity of illness and illness broadly, not a specific illness. If you have low vitamin D, you're probably going to be sicker. So getting safe sun is a big one. Sunshine is the best source of vitamin D. That said, we're kind of outside of the vitamin D making sunshine here in southwestern Ontario and most parts of Canada and even the US. Um, so if you have safe tanning practices, some people will try and do that. It's a little controversial. We never want to burn, but a healthy dose and it's, you know, six or seven minutes twice a week of a tanning bed can really up that vitamin D. The bonus of that is that sunshine will convert cholesterol to vitamin D and that's where it comes from. So if you have a slightly elevated cholesterol, some sunshine converts that to vitamin D and can help with high cholesterol. Uh, vitamin D is associated to increased susceptibility to infections and also to increased autoimmune response. So we want to make sure that we're optimizing vitamin D and optimal is really the word. Some people will talk about, you know, I had my, my doctor checked my vitamin D, it cost me money and it was crazy and he said it was fine. And fine is never what we're aiming for in a functional practice, we're looking for optimal. And that's a very different line that would be drawn. Uh, some people only need one or 2000 IU of vitamin D a day. Some people need 10, some people need more. So we wanna make sure that it's customized to you. And vitamin D regulates thousands of genes including almost 200 of them that are within the immune system itself. Uh, some estimates would say that almost 90% of North Americans are deficient, functionally deficient, maybe not lab test deficient, but functionally deficient in vitamin D. So considering testing with your doctor or a naturopath can do that with a blood draw. I think the test is around 30 or $35 still so far. A uh, nutritionist like myself can do blood spot testing and have a look at vitamin D. It's a little more expensive uh, to do it that way. I think it's $75, but sometimes it's information that's good to have. You know, you don't want to not add enough vitamin D, but you don't also want to put too much because it is one that will store in the body and can become toxic. It is a fat stored vitamin. So we want to be careful. I don't know if you remember as a child, I know I do, my lovely mother would give us cod liver oil in the winter time, pretty much October to April. We would have cod liver oil with breakfast every morning and it was horrible and my sister would make me take hers because it was gross, a little capsule, and I would. And they really knew how to do it. And cod liver oil is high in omegas or omegas are protective. Each and every cell in our body is made from fat. It has a phospholipid membrane. Those lipids are fat. And it also contains vitamin D and vitamin A, which are very protective of those wintertime diseases. If we are supplementing with vitamin D, we may want to add vitamin K with that for bone health and for absorption. That can be helpful. Also, vitamin C. So vitamin C is a powerful antioxidant. Uh, also strengthens the immune system, both by supporting the innate and the adaptive immune system. So it's helpful on both branches of the immune system. Uh, doesn't have to be citrus, citrus is lovely, but broccoli and kale and beautiful peppers and even lemon water, a good source of vitamin C those brightly colored antioxidant foods. Uh, 
quercetin is another one. It's one of those lovely flavanols. I was looking at studies that showed a lot of promise. I think it was 2003 when the last SARS scare was going on. Uh, a lot of clinical evidence that quercetin was really helpful for that uh, end of SARS. This is another variation. Viruses are very similar a lot of the time, so there may be some benefit to using quercetin. Resveratrol, resveratrol from red grapes and other foods uh, may also be helpful. Uh, nettle tea is one that I find pretty easy to add into my life. I'll drink a cup or two of nettle tea a day, and it is one of the best sources of quercetin um, that's out there. It has those antiviral properties, and the way that the quercetin acts on the immune system is that it blocks surface viral proteins. So those bits of virus that get in and try and stick to the surface of the cell so that they can enter, it blocks them from entering the cell and proliferating. So if it can't get in, it can't do any harm. So the quercetin can be helpful there. Uh, found in a lot of fruits and vegetables. It is abundant. If you are eating your six to nine cups of vegetables a day, you're probably getting enough quercetin that you wouldn't need to supplement. Things like berries and brassicas, like the cruciferous veggies, cabbage and napa, uh, mustard, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, turnips and radishes and kale and collard greens. Uh, grapes, onions, and shallots like in the picture, tomatoes, even nuts and seeds, and most leafy greens will have some quercetin. And then the sleep piece. Ideally seven to nine hours. I think most of the folks that I see right now are in the KW area. I think it was a 2015 study that said 86% of their respondents got six or fewer hours of sleep three or more nights a week. So six or, six or fewer hours, three or more nights. And it was like 86%. That's people that we're on the road with. These are people we're in, interacting with every day. Not ideal not for mood, not for anything, but definitely not for the immune system. Uh, people with poor sleep or disordered sleep, so we're looking at people who have frequent wakings or they don't have a significant amount of REM sleep or deep sleep, we call that disordered, will have lower natural killer T cell activity. And this will increase the circulating pro-inflammatory, so the actually inflammatory cytokines. Now cytokine storm is a thing that's been in the news recently. So we don't want to have excess amounts of cytokines. This is what causes the damage to tissue. So increasing inflammation. And you have to kind of know where your sweet spot is. Seven hours is not quite enough for me. Nine might be too many. Uh, you'll have to pay attention to that. Uh, the other piece with sleep is that sleep isn't something we can bank. So if we go to bed early tonight and we get lots of sleep, we can't have less sleep tomorrow. We have to earn tomorrow's sleep today. We have to make sure we are paying attention to getting some exercise and moving around and using our brains. There is a significant amount of data on melatonin and its effect on limiting viral disease. Melatonin is made in the presence of darkness. So it takes B vitamins and takes your serotonin that makes you feel energetic and blissful through the day. And it takes those B vitamins and converts them, that serotonin to melatonin and aids in that sleepiness and sleep. So sometimes we want to consider supplementing if our sleep isn't great. I'll often start not with melatonin, but with things like magnesium that can help with relaxation. Uh, some people really like magnesium bisglycinate. Some I really like the magnesium threonate. 
It's one that crosses the blood brain barrier. So it helps to calm the brain and does show increased alertness the next day. So that's nice that you're not left with. Some people will find like a melatonin hangover because they take too high a dose. Uh, SSRIs, I wouldn't take melatonin with. Um, perhaps L-theanine or a magnesium L-theanine combination. And exercise. So yes, exercise is important for so many areas that we've already talked about. So increasing air turnover in the lungs. The lungs are an emunctory. This is something that gets rid of the garbage. We have you know, our urinary system, the digestive system through the bowels. We've got our sweat. We'll also get rid of garbage and our breath out of our lungs. So if we are using our lungs, we're getting some panting going on and being active, finding ways to exert ourselves, that can help flush out that. Um, we do see positive changes to antibodies and white blood cells in people who exercise. And it doesn't have to be crazy CrossFit exercise. 20 minutes of walking a couple of times a day is exercise. Uh, it does also help to clear up the lymph system. We saw in one of the earlier slides, the lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes are all over the entire body. You've got lots down under your chin and your neck, through the armpits, through the groin, but they're throughout the body, but they don't have a pump, like your circulatory system has the heart pumping the blood around. Your lymph system doesn't have that. It requires actual muscles to contract and expand for it to be pumping around. Uh, lower stress. We know that exercise lowers stress. Getting out there into the big old world helps as well. Uh, finding a green space and grounding, but we don't want to overdo it. And it's that overdoing it that can raise cortisol and that stress hormone and that can actually have negative effects on the immune system. We want to be mindful of that, especially if we're already not feeling great. We don't want to overdo it with exercise and stress the body. And hydration. It sounds like it should be a really easy one, but a lot of people don't get enough water. And water is water. People will come in, they're like, oh, you know, I'm fine. I should be hydrated. I had like two cups of coffee this morning. Coffee's not water. Coffee requires water to be metabolized. So we want to have water helping to flush those toxins from the body. So yes, they will flush through the kidneys, they'll flush with extra water through the bowels, helps keep things moving, bulk up the fiber that we've eaten with our six to nine cups of colorful vegetables, but it also keeps the blood moving. So our blood is 70% water, so keeping that moving is helpful. And our lymph system also. So the lymph, if it's all dried out, it can be sluggish and creeping along and it makes it hard to get rid of the garbage in the system. Uh, we talk about lymphatic, the glymphatic system is found in the brain. It too is connected to that lymph system and requires good hydration so that it can flush the garbage out. In the glymphatic system, we worry more about the beta amyloid plaques. Those are the ones that are connected to uh, Alzheimer's disease. So if we're flushing those out of the body when we're getting our six to nine hours sleep, that's really helpful for overall health and immune health. And cultivating a healthy microbiome. This lovely picture is a picture of the fire cider that I made back in the springtime. And the recipe should go up on my blog in the next little bit. Um, but basically, in whatever combination you like, onions and garlic. Garlic is antimicrobial. It aids in immune function. Ginger, there are lots of studies that show how anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial ginger is. Uh, there's a turmeric there. Again, it's anti-inflammatory and it can modulate the activation of T cells and B cells and macrophages and neutrophils and NK cells. And modulate was what we were talking about earlier. 
If they're sluggish, it'll give them a little bit of a kick. And if they're overactive, it can help to calm them down. So turmeric can be really helpful in a fire cider or in other food. I'll sometimes put turmeric in like butternut squash soup or we'll do a recipe um, with mangoes and turmeric for another bright color and we'll make ice cream, which is fantastic. But modulating a lot of those immune cells. Uh, other things like the hot peppers, they're a nice circulatory. They get your blood pumping, they get you sweating. That helps citrus, vitamin C. And we take all those things. Horseradish is another one that has a lot of antioxidant properties, really does stimulate the circulatory system as well with that spice that it has. And we want to put that in a mason jar and then cover it all up with apple cider vinegar and put it in a cool dark place for two to four weeks depending on how crazy spicy you like things and then strain the chopped things out and seal it. And that helps because it's fermented. Fermented foods are great. So maybe you're not a big fire cider fan, but things like kombucha or sauerkraut or kimchi or kefir that are fermented contain those good bacteria, the probiotic bacteria that will modulate immune response using IgA or IgG immune cells and B cells. Uh, fermented foods also contain biotin and folate, which are trickier to come by um, which is helpful for many of the immune functions as well. Uh, with the fire cider, uh, when I was back in the fall and trying to stay super healthy, I would just take it in a shot. I would put a tablespoon or two in a shot glass and just chug it down and follow it with some lemon ginger honey. Kept me pretty healthy. Now I'm adding it to my salad dressing. So I like the couple of tablespoons of fire cider with olive oil or avocado oil and I'll shake it up and put it on my salad. Adds a nice zing and it's easy to use and get that ferment in there without doing some of the sauerkrauts and things that we sometimes do. And that microbiome is even more important now in the face of our current overuse of hand sanitizer. I think every single store that we walk into has the sanitizer at the front and then you're rubbing that on. So we wanna make sure that we are getting some kind of good bacteria into the body because it's probably not coming off of our dirty hands because we're not eating carrots fresh out of the garden these days. Uh, the importance of fiber as well. So I don't know that we really touched on that. If you're eating your vegetables, there's going to be fiber there, uh, but it does take fiber to feed those bacteria. It's a prebiotic. It's helping the good bacteria to grow. So fiber is helpful. So we got our top tips recap. Washing your hands, watching your blood sugar and your blood pressure, eating nutrient dense food, especially protein with each eating opportunity, colorful vegetables, optimizing vitamin C, vitamin D, Thinking about quercetin, getting those vegetables in, uh, getting adequate sleep and some exercise, staying hydrated and cultivating that healthy biome. There are other things to ponder that didn't get their whole slide. So nitric oxide is one. Um, it's one I'm gonna probably keep around my house because it acts in a number of helpful ways. Um, it will act as a vasodilator, so it helps to open up that vascular system. It will balance Th1 and Th2 immunity, so kind of from both ends of the spectrum. Uh, supports the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, that's helpful in times of stress, and reduces cytokine storm while supporting microphage activity. So I, think that it could be helpful. There are foods you can get nitrite from that will convert in the body if you are healthy and have good stomach acid into that nitric oxide. Things like cilantro and arugula and beets 
and rhubarb, basil is reasonable. Uh, you'll also see pictured the liposomal glutathione. Glutathione is an amino acid and it is essential for the health of the immune system and the digestive tract. Uh, in the gut, it promotes health and function of the mucosal cells, which helps for healing and repair. The NAC, the N-acetylcysteine that's pictured there, um, is a precursor to the glutathione. So depends which flavor I'm feeling like that day. Uh, black seed oil isn't pictured, but it is one that when administered early, rendered bronchial viral infections non-infections. So it was present, but it couldn't actually infect the cell. So black seed oil is one that's pretty easy to come across. I know Anorex makes a great one, comes in liquid or in capsules. There's a lot going on there. Now I will see if I can see, because we did allow time for questions. Can I get into the chat and see what those questions are? I may stop the screen share here. Turn my do stop share. And turn my camera back on so we can actually talk to each other. Maybe, maybe not. Come on video. There we go. On and then off, lovely. Beautiful. You gotta love it. So looking at questions and comments and things. Dun, 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 dun. So Alicia, Nutrisy fish oil. Oh, I agree. Nutrisy is delicious. The other one that I really like is Designs for Health has one that's called Omega Veil. They have a flavor that is what do they call it? Mango peach, I believe. And it tastes like a peach smoothie. It is delicious. So compliance goes way up when it tastes good. I think you're right. Uh, red onions for quercetin, better than like a green onion. They all have different flavonoids. So if you're doing one one day and one the other, that's that whole rainbow. Uh, melatonin, can they disrupt sleep? There are some people who will report that melatonin keeps them awake. There is no solid evidence of people will talk about retrograde, kind of converting back from melatonin to serotonin, so it's wakeful. I haven't been able to find a study that says that, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. So melatonin's not for everyone. Um, magnesium a little bit safer L-theanine, uh, lemon balm tea, one of my favorites at bedtime. I find lemon balm at bedtime to be fantastic for sleep. Do you have to be careful of that Th1, Th2 if you know you have an autoimmune disease because um, it can play with that regulation. Uh, fire cider in salad, absolutely. Yep. I'll probably have a picture of it like that on the blog when we put that recipe up. And were there other questions, concerns? Alrighty, so what about an idea of what was something you learned? If you wanna let me know in the chat or I can unmute you if you wanna throw your two cents in. Everybody knew everything. Fantastic. Well, I will definitely keep everybody posted as to what's going on as far as in the clinic. Um, if you have a look on the blog in the next couple of weeks, uh, you'll see that fire cider recipe for sure and ways to integrate it that don't taste so terrible. Um, it's not pleasant, but it's super helpful. Um, back in February, we had some nasty sickness going around and I didn't get it. Everybody else got it. I had no time for it. I just took my shot morning and night of fire cider and kept it at bay. So it's got a lot of good stuff going. Designs for health omegas. Oh, Veronica. I had samples. I'm gonna have to buy another one because it is really good. Uh, I think 
As far as serving size, it depends how much you're thinking of. I had an old pickle jar that I used that had the nice mason jar lid for the fire cider. So I eyeballed it as to what was going to fit in the jar and chopped it up and covered it. Yep, yeah, start small if you're not sure. And then when you fall in love with it, you can do a huge jar and you'll be weirdo like me, swigging fire cider. The spiciness, I did make an AIP version that omitted the uh, peppers from the fire cider. So they had ginger and horseradish. If you're not a huge spicy person, use less of those, more onions, more garlic. It's food, it's not science. So you can play with it however it's going to work better for you for sure. If that makes sense, Barb. Excellent. Alrighty, and you all know that you can reach me here at Verdure. Um, it is Melanie at VerdureWellnessClinic.com if you want to reach me directly. I'm happy to get emails from people and answer quick questions. If you want a clarification at some point, definitely feel free to reach out. Hopefully everybody took a little bit of something away and it's hard to talk about everything immune in 45 minutes to an hour. So I think we got a lot of good stuff in um, and hopefully that will help everybody get safer and healthier through the rest of the winter season that's coming. We're heading into fall and winter soon. So we'll try and keep everybody happy and healthy and 